Good morning and welcome. Since this is my last uh, full TDL lecture of my career, I'd like it to be inspirational as well as thought provoking. At the end of it, I hope you can go home anxious to create your own exceptional team using tools that we're going to give you here today. I'm proud to be joined by my partner, Dr. Jess Rober, <coughs> Joy, and Ingrid, who are going to help in providing a different perspective on learning and, and team building. And then we're going to have Jess's husband talk to us about his experience with team building. And he knows all about that because he's a Navy SEAL. <coughs> so thank you, Matt, for coming and telling us how real teams work. 15 years ago, I made a slide. <coughs> uh, I, read the, I read the business literature, the entrepreneurial literature, just because I love these books that say, well, what are the common characteristics of entrepreneurs? And, you know, attempting to find the, the characteristics that's common to all of them. And um, some of that business literature is actually pretty good, but a lot of it is a lot of BS. Um, <clears throat> a lot of entrepreneurs are very successful simply because they were lucky. Um, I'm one of those. Um, but I wanted to do something similar on what really distinguishes really what what are the common characteristics of really top clinicians? And I came up with this list. I'm not going to read it to you. I'd like you to read it yourself silently. <clears throat> so I'm going to tell some stories today about how and why I came up with this specific list. And if I can get you to adopt some of these characteristics and you apply them in your life, you will create a team better and more productive than you ever imagined. <clears throat> We're going to be talking about each one of these things individually multiple times throughout the day. If I was to do this list today, there isn't a single thing I would change. When my good friend Rick Schwartz heard uh, that this was going to be my last lecture, he called and said, hey, why don't you make it about how you came up with all this stuff? And I said, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I want to make it about how to create an exceptional team. And then I, I thought about it some more because I don't, I don't like talking about myself and I'm a very private person. But then I thought, you know, maybe these things are related to each other. There are certain things in my background that if people knew about, it might help you because you will recognize these things in your background as well. And it gives me an opportunity to really review how I came up. TDOers, for those of you who aren't actually TDOers, I've tortured TDOers for 25 years with all of these sayings. And I think if you knew where some of these sayings came from, it might help you. So I thank Rick for the suggestion. Um, <clears throat> if it works, you can thank him. If it doesn't work, you can, you can blame me. <clears throat> so the first section is how and why I developed a certain mindset encapsulated by the prior slide and how I think that mindset can help you if you, will, if you are able to adopt it. As you'll see, I'm a bit of an archivist. I've saved stuff from, from my youth, and I'm going to be showing uh, some of those things. And then we're going to shoot some hoops. And I'm going to make a fool out of myself, and I'm going to play a little guitar piece for you, hoping to illustrate some of these principles of the mindset that I think are so important and that if, if you can adopt yourself, you will be able to accomplish any goal that you set out for yourself. <clears throat> so the topic is how to train for excellence. Like everyone, my perceptions come from my experience. And in the last half of my career, my experience has been in mentoring and being mentored 
by endodontists. So I, I think some people here may not be aware that at the end of our 10-year period of PERF training, we had met, I had met, my team had met, almost one-third of the practicing specialty and about 70% of the postgraduate directors we had trained at PERF. So I had this tremendous experience in physically meeting one-third of the practicing specialty. I don't think there's anything like it in medicine or dentistry anywhere. Um, it's a little embarrassing today because I meet these people that have come out to the training and I can't remember everyone. Um, except the ones I didn't like, I remember them, but. <laughs> but what did I get? I got experience in observing how people train themselves, how they train their staff, uh, and how quickly they go up the learning curve. You know, some people go up the learning curve very quickly and others never go up the learning curve. And I was always interested, well, why is that? Why do some people just get better and better and others just never really leave whatever they learned in the postgraduate programs? So myself, Joy, and uh, the guest faculty members who, who helped me over this 10-year period, we saw virtually every kind of clinician, every kind of practice in North America. And I saw these people not only in a training environment, but we had everyone out to our home. I had them to my office. I had them to the lab. Uh, we celebrated the birth of their kids. Sashi showed this thing last night. He, he showed a six, his six foot, year, uh, six foot daughter there. Well, this is her uh, right in the middle there after she was born. So we celebrated uh, her, her birth with, with Sashi. So, I feel like uh, I know these people and I, I kind of understand how they're thinking. After you, after you meet 1,500 endodontists, you kind of get a sense of what the specialty is like. And uh, not only in this country, this is one word that we put on for foreign doctors. So we, we've trained a tremendous number of doctors from foreign countries. So even the foreign practice environment, uh, I feel like I had uh, a pulse on. And then I've been in a lot of endodontic. I've probably been in maybe 100, 150 different endodontic offices watching, watching them. And I don't think many people have that experience. Maybe if you're lucky, you'd be in two or three endodontic offices. I've been over 100 endodontic offices seeing how people work. So I, I hope you don't feel I'm too con conceited in saying, you know, I think I have my pulse on this specialty. I think I. I think I know where this specialty is. <clears throat> I've listened to all the problems. You know, you give people a couple of drinks and they let their hair down a little bit and you find out how they really think. You know how that works, don't you? So this is just a schedule from uh, three years of, of what our training was. So you can kind of see how hectic this really was. Um, I used to come home. We had a young son at that time and he said, who are you? I'm your father. He says, oh, I have a father? So uh, this, is, this is a good example of a life out of balance. <laughs> but I did have some fun and I got a lot of experience. So four years ago, I made a YouTube video explaining how to train an assistant in seven days. It's had over 72,000 views on YouTube. Unbelievable for a dental vid video. But it was the comments posted that were really troubling to me. And I don't know if any of you have seen it. They loved it. This is inspirational. And then there were some, there were some others that weren't so good. But I'm thinking, these comments, this is so inspirational. I love this video. Jesus, it's just a training video. Why would it be inspirational? It's, it's just, we're just training people. And then it became a problem because some of the comments from doctors, you can't train an older person. Uh, an assistant is just an entry level position. And it was, it was shocking to me that doctors would think of members of their team as an entry level 
position or that that you couldn't train an older person because they're too set in their ways. And it, it got me thinking that we, we have a problem uh, in our specialty, in the profession of dentistry, actually. So I want to identify the problem. It, here's one of them. Young girls help, but from my experience, they are not reliable workers. And find the right one that will be easy to twink, quick on their feet, and unless you have a DA that's been assisting for a long time, but one's over 40, they have no clue of what the struggle will, will be like. I don't know about you, but when I hear comments like that, it's really irritating to me. I don't, I don't like that kind of, of a mindset. I can't imagine telling an employee of mine, you know, I'm hiring you because this is an entry level position. That person has no clue on what a team is or how to create a team. And they, their team will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. They will always be, they will always have entry level. I think actually that doctor is an entry level person himself, so. Let's identify the problem. Conceptually, there are three problems. The first problem is a failure to understand what is possible, and I'm going to talk almost exclusively about that and not the other two, two problems, because that's the biggest problem to solve, and that is your problem. Your problem is in understanding what is possible. And my job today, and Jess's job, is to get you to expand your horizon and realize you are, you are capable of far more than you think is possible. I've tortured TDRs with this slide for years. Uh, to accomplish any high goal, understand the possibility, figure out the details, execute the vision. That's all you gotta do. Three simple rules in life. Those are the, that's all you need to do. And the hardest one is the first one. That's the hardest one. And my job today is to make you understand why you have that problem. Figuring out the details, you know, dentists are detailed people. You ever do a bonded resin? It's pretty detailed. We're detailed people. We don't have a problem with details. We can figure out the details. The problem is understanding the possibility of how good you can be. You don't actually know how good you can be until you test yourself and challenge yourself. It's one of the reasons why it's well known in psychology. People only really, really live up to about 30% of their potential. There's all this untapped potential. Why should that be? Why is that? <clears throat> I think I know. So whenever you're going to start on this journey, and it's always a good idea to start with the end in mind. These are the two foundational sayings of TDO. That's why I started with these two sayings, because they encapsulate where you want to be. Happiness is an activity of the soul in conformity with virtue. A well-lived life is the full development of one's abilities in a life affording them scale. God, how can you say it any clearer than that? We are destined. Our happiness is tied up with excellence. The end is excellence. And if you want a fulfilling career, then it has to be one committed to excellence. That's what TDO was about. That's what I've been about my whole life. <clears throat> the fulfillment you get is directly proportional to how well you do it. <clears throat> so that's where we're headed. We're headed towards Creating a team with a culture of excellence. That's what we're trying to do. Now, this is Mrs. Gilson's fourth grade class. I'm 10 years old here. I'm small for my age. And Mrs. Gilson told my parents that I was the most curious kid she had ever seen in her whole career of, of, of teaching. That's me there, in case you didn't recognize it. <laughs> and here I am on the couch reading about uh, nuclear explosions and nu nuclear bombs. And my dad was a little frustrated because everything I touched, I took apart, thinking, you know, if I take it apart, I can figure out how it works. So I was a human, human destroyer. It's probably significant I looked a little like Dennis the Menace. This is my father. 
One day he said to me, really frustrated, you know, if you really want to know how things work, you need to learn how to put them back together again. <laughs> I told my dad I tried, but I just break them. And then my dad said something very important. He said, well, a more sure way of figuring out how things work is if you can build them from scratch. And then you'll really know how they work. If you can build them from scratch, and that, that actually made a lot of sense to me. And I spent my time back then, this is, I'm 10 years old, this is 1957, and Popular Electronics was just my cup of tea. It taught you how to build things from scratch. I just loved it. And it turns out, in the back of that magazine was this ad from a company in San Antonio, Texas called the American Basic Science Club. And what the American Basic Science Club had is every month you would get a kit and you would build all kinds of things. There were 12 or 15 kits and in all different areas of science, sound, electricity, heat, electronics, light, atomic energy. These kits profoundly affected my life. Changed it in, in a way you can hardly overestimate. I feel, bear with me. Not only giving me a, a, a lifelong love affair with science, but more importantly, teaching me that almost nothing is impossible. So by the time I was 10 years old, there was nothing impossible for me. And I hope to be able to demonstrate how that mindset enabled me to come up with all this stuff. This is a computer we built. I like to kid Luis. You know, he says, Dr. Carr, I've been programming since I was 14 years old. I said, Luis, I was building computers before you were even born. He goes, ah! So I've saved these. These are the, these are the kits. It was, I think it was $3.95 a month. And every month, you'd get a different area of science, and you'd build things from scratch. They came in a little cardboard box like this, the happiest day of the month. And when you opened the box, you had all of, all of this stuff, and you built things from scratch. These are some of the pages for some of the books. I built all kinds of things. I built a microscope, which you'll hear about later, a telescope, a spectrograph, a radio transmitter, a radio receiver. This is today, this material would probably be junior college material. I'm 10 years old and I'm learning this stuff. I'm learning all about science and how to build things. Now, this is my parents and my grandparents. My granddad was a very well-known civil engineer. He was the head engineer for many of the hydroelectric plants in Asia. He spent the last half of his career in Turkey building these uh, hydroelectric plants. He was the head engineer. And he retired to Florida and we went down for his wedding anniversary and I happened to have my American Basic Science Club. Kits. I took them with me. I didn't want to sit and talk to my grandparents. I wanted to, I wanted to build things. And my granddad was a typical engineer, much more comfortable with a slide rule than he was actually communicating with people. And he's just sitting in his chair. I'm on the floor. I'm doing this. I'm trying to figure it out. He doesn't help me. He's just sitting there looking and reading the paper. Then he's, he's, he's looking. And he doesn't say anything. <clears throat> I get up one morning, and this is the, this is the radio that I was building there. I've, I've saved that. And I find written in the back of one of my books, the will to win is not nearly as important as the will to prepare to win. Forrest Evershevsky said that. He wrote that in my book. I have the book at home. I've kept it all these years. I got a kick out of this when I put it on TDO Clinical. Somebody said, oh, Bobby Knight said that. And somebody said, no, it was Vince Lombardi. Well, I know who really said it, because my grandfather wrote it for me when I was 10 years old. And I've kept it all these years. And I made it into a TDO saying. <clears throat> 
So that's where one of the first sayings came from. The will to win is not nearly as important as the will to prepare to win. I typed it out, I kept it, I kept it in my wallet. Whenever I had doubts, whenever I didn't think I could do it, I took it out and I read it to myself. And I've tried to get TDOers to do that on these sayings. You just don't read a saying, you have to repeat it to yourself. It's like a mantra, like an Indian thought thing. Repeat it over and over again. When you have doubts, take out your sayings, repeat them over. The will to win is not nearly as important as the will to prepare to win. It will give you strength. It will give you strength. It's a form of hypnotism, I suppose, or what do they say today, brainwashing. <clears throat> In Kit 4, you build a transmitter that could send Morse code. And I learned you could actually become a ham radio operator and talk to people all over the world through the magic of radio waves. It seemed incredible to me. Remember, this is black and white TVs now, OK? This is black and white. So I'm 10 years old. So you mean to tell me I can sit in my bedroom and I can talk to people all over the world? It seemed incredible to me. And we, I actually built a transmitter, a receiver, a code generator. <clears throat> and I said, you know, I want to I want to be a ham radio. I'm going to become a ham radio operator. You had to pass a test by the FCC, testing your knowledge of electronics. And you had to read Morris code at 15 words a minute. Well, I wasn't worried about the FCC test because I had the American Basic Science Club kid. I knew all about electronics. I know how, I, I built this stuff. I knew how it worked. <laughs> so I really struggled with the audio part, the, the Morse code. I have trouble with English, as you can tell. So uh, I, I just couldn't do it. I could, I'd listen to it, and I, I, I get so. I was, I was really, I, I, I went, <clears throat> this is Morse code at 15 words a minute. Okay, you get, the, you get the idea. This is my mother. I go to her one day and I said, you know, I, I know I can pass the written code. I really want to become a hammer, right? but I can't learn this code. I just, I just can't, I, I can't do it. She says to me, oh my heavens, this is easy. This is what she tells me. Learn one letter a day. Just concentrate on one letter a day. The next day, learn a new letter and review the letters you knew the previous days. She says, I guarantee you on day 26, you'll be able to pass the test easily. I said, are you kidding me? I don't, I don't believe that, but I'm, I'll try it. I'll try it. Learning one letter a day. Sound familiar? What do you think happened on day 26? Thirty words a minute. It's funny. I can still copy it. Sixty years later, I can still copy it. Isn't long-term memory incredible? Okay. So this is my mindset now. What, what, what have I learned? I've, I've learned that if you take complex problems and break them down into small little parts and learn one thing at a time, that almost nothing is impossible. By the time I became a ham radio operator and had gone through all these kits, I think I can do anything. There's nothing in this world that I can't do. I felt this way my whole life because of this experience. And I need to be able to convince you to, to embrace that concept about yourselves because it's the truth. It's the truth. Take complex problems, break them down. And you can see as we do our training, that's how we, that's how we do our training. 
And the effect that this has is, is unbelievable. So by age 10, I was already formulating how smart people function, because my mother was really smart. <laughs> and because I lived this, uh, I took something that was, I thought was really difficult and complex, and I mastered it in a month. <laughs> the lesson has never left me and has informed my entire life and approach to difficult problems. Almost all problems are easier than you think they are. Almost everything is easier. <laughs> so as a 10-year-old, my horizons are already being altered, and there's little I, uh, little I do that I don't, don't feel I can accomplish. Just take it step by step. Understand the possibility. That's the hump you need to get over. I also know and made part of my mindset that the, your dreams are possible, but only if you focus on the details. It isn't enough to have just big dreams. If you have big dreams but won't focus on the detail, it's never going to work for you. And I think as a 10-year-old, this, this seems so important to me that I was so far ahead of my classmates who weren't even thinking about this stuff, but I was thinking about it then. I had a mindset. Take complex problems, break them down into small parts, do one thing at a time. <laughs> I had a friend contact me a couple months ago. I haven't seen him since, since I was 12 years old. Bobby Bender, we, he wanted to be a ham radio opera too, uh, operator too, but he couldn't learn the code. He couldn't get past the code. Maybe he didn't have a mother that told him the secret. He didn't have a mother that gave him the secret of how to do this. So I got my ham radio op operator, but my little American Basic Science Club transmitter it was only two watts. I needed like 60 watts if I wanted to use the magic of radio waves and talk to people all over the, we all over the world. So there was a company in Michigan called Heathkit, and you could build your own transmitter. And this is the transmitter that I built. I still have it. I've kept it all these years. You can imagine when I was in my Navy, the call from my parents, you know, we got all this crap in the attic. What do you want? I don't, don't you dare throw any of that away. <laughs> so what I learned in the American Basic Science Club kit is you get these kits, but sometimes there was a mistake in the kit. They didn't send all the parts, and that was a disaster because you couldn't build it. So I got in the habit, before I did anything, I laid all the parts out, and I found each one, and I checked each one off to make sure that I had every single part. And it also taught you the names. You learned the names of the parts, too. So this was a habit that I developed very, very early in life. I mean, I'm 10 years old. I'm, I'm checking every little thing. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? <clears throat> so in the Heathkit thing, well, there's, there's, a, there's over a thousand parts. So I go through this checkoff list. I'm also getting reinforcement from the American Basic Science Club experience of how important step-by-step -step procedures are. Connect a five-inch red wire from lug one on terminal strip G to lug one of electrolytic capacitor K. Next step, connect one end of this, do this, do it step by step. Don't just do everything at once, step by step. And as you see in the training, when we're talking to you about the training, I took that mindset and that's how we approach training. We've always done training this way. For my 40 years, I've always known how to train people because I took it from this. Does that help any of you at all? Is this helpful? or is it just so boring? <laughs> this, is, this is my original step-by-step -step notes when we created TDO. Can you see where this comes from? Check off lists. In the process, I'm learning a new language, the language of electronics, and understanding 
If you want domain expertise in any field, you must learn the language of that, of that field. And um, the language of electronics is schematic diagrams, being able to look at a diagram like this. Now, to you, it might look like gobbledygook. From the American Basic Science Club, I can look at that. Oh, OK, let's follow the signal. I can see where the signal goes. I know what all these things do. I actually know how it works <laughs> from the time I was 10 years old. This is me at 15, talking with people all over the world. <laughs> but I learned an even more important lesson from this. And what is that? When you talk to someone, you send them your QSL card. That's just a card with your call letters. I was WB2BBJ and you send them a card and you collect these cards. Everyone you talk to, you want to get their QSL card. I've saved these cards for, for 60 years. I never, I never threw them out. <laughs> it's hard for me to talk about this. What did we talk about? We just helped each other. I'm having trouble with my uh, television interference on my second stage amp. Oh, Dr. Carr, or uh, uh, WB2BBJ, this is what I do, this is what I did. All we did was help each other with our equipment. We just talked about our equipment, that's all we did. We didn't discuss politics, we talked about our equipment, we just help, it's a helping community. Today, when I meet a ham radio opera, we are friends, automatically. We're friends because we're part of this community. So by the time I'm 14 years old, I already have a sense of what a community is like, how powerful it can be. I have this sense of it, I know it, I've lived it myself. <clears throat> so when I formed my own community, I did it with this knowledge of what a community could be, what are the possibilities of a community united by common values, common interests, common goals. So in the back of my mind is this ham radio experience of how powerful communities are. <clears throat> Look at this guy. See Rick Schwartz there? That's when he was, is Rick here? Are you here? You were good looking back then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is this is the IAE. This is a community that we formed. Again, the same thing as the ham radio community. A community unified, bonded together by common values, common interests with an overarching desire to help each other. Isn't that what the TDO community is? We want to help each other. What can I do to help you? That's the, that's the mindset. It's so powerful. <clears throat> I just got this from Michael Foreman. I don't know if Michael, Michael is here, but I like what he said. He, it's a private email, but he says, the culture you created is what I try to create in my office after 14 years of practice. I still ask, what would Dr. Carr do? That's what you are doing. And I want you to think about training differently now, from now on. You are not training. You are creating a culture or embellishing a culture or refining the culture. You're not training. Yes, you're training, but toward the end goal of creating a culture, that's what you do, a culture of excellence. You're just using training to embellish that culture. So when you look at, well, okay, what am I trying to do with this person? You are trying to inculcate in them a culture of excellence. You use training as a way to do it. It's, it's a different way of thinking about this. <laughs> Now, most people think Rob Kaufman and I are mortal enemies. 
I mean, he's spoken about, every, he's been against everything I've ever been involved with. Micro, he thought microscopes were a joke. Taking photographs, that's so stupid. Using the draw page, who talks to patients? He was against the CBCT, I could go on and on. We've called each other terrible names, pygmy, comrade, because he's a socialist. <laughs> we're still friends. Why? He's a ham radio operator. He's a ham radio operator. See how strong that bond is? It's strong. This is a private note he, he, he sent me. He said, I'm sorry I can't be at the TTO meeting to harass you. I'm going to a competition in Mexico among ham radio operators. They have these competitions where they see who can who can send the best signal in and whatnot. So he's in Mexico, but he sent me a private note apologizing for not being at the TDO meeting. Okay, the fifth American Basic Science Club, uh, uh, club kit was a, a microscope. So I built a microscope. I learned all kinds of things. I learned how to fix tissue. I learned how to slice tissue. I learned how to mount it on slides. This is my homemade microtome. I'm 10 years old and I'm learning how to do this stuff. By the end of this thing, I'm thinking, there's nothing I can't do. You know, that's not conceit. That's, that's a mindset that you learn by doing things, by building things, by accomplishing things. <clears throat> learned how to stain tissue, and you'll see how this applies later, and learned how to mount them, how to look at tissue. So I've been looking through a microscope since I was 10 years old for hours, hours at a time. So when I was actually doing some research on, on endodontic surgery, um, I. I'm, I'm in Terry Tanaka's lab, we're doing these dissections, I'm seeing these apical lesions around prior surgeries, and I'm looking at it, so you know, I, I, I need to take a look at this with my microscope, but I need, I need an electron microscope to really look at this properly. And what did this end up developing in? Will it develop? This is one of the reasons why you're using a microscope today, why you use our ultrasonic tips to do it. Endodontics was changed dramatically by this development, all because I'm looking at this under a microscope. So I take my specimens down to Scripps Oceanography. They had, they had a electron microscope there that they rented out. So you could, for $250 an hour, you could take your specimen and there would be a technician there and he'd put it into the scope and you'd look at it and uh, I did this initially at, at Scripps, and th then I realized, you know, at $250 an hour, when you're looking at an electron microscope, you can't do a heck of a lot in an hour. It takes hours and hours. So I said, God, I'm going to go poor doing this. Um, <laughs> and I asked the guy, I didn't know anything about electron microscopes, how much, was, how much is this microscope that we're using? Oh, it's a million and a half dollars. Ouch. Well, you can't afford that. <clears throat> And he says, but you know, and he knows I'm kind of interested in this and that I'm not going to be able to keep going because it was just too expensive. He says, you know, when these companies, um, when, these, when these tools break, the companies don't know what to do with them and they usually sell them for salvage. You know where I'm going with this, don't you? Uh, This is the first electron microscope I bought from General Dynamics for $2,000. It's sitting here in my garage. The reason I show you this is to make a point of why it's so important to understand what is possible and what is not possible. Because I think most people look at this and they, th they think, oh, well, I'm never going to do that. What is an electron microscope? It's a power supply. It's an amplifier. It's a signal generator, it's a vacuum, and it's a detector. I already, I already built all this stuff when I was 10 years old. I knew power supplies, amplifiers, signal tracers. It isn't a difference in capability, it's just a difference in degree. 
Does that make sense to you? It's just a difference of degree, not in, in concept. I, when I went up to General Dynamics, I, I only asked two questions. When was it last working? And do you have the schematics for it? Right? That's all I needed. So, as part of this possibility thing is, what, what, what I would like you to realize, it is what can be holding many of you back is this fear of failure. And to live life, to live in this world unafraid is the greatest gift that you can give your child or give yourself. You cannot be afraid. I didn't know anything about electron microscopes. It wouldn't surprise me if I failed. I didn't care if I failed. I wasted $2,000, okay? But I learned something about electron microscopes. Maybe the next one, I wouldn't make such a stupid decision. I'd be smarter about it, or there's all kinds of things. Don't be afraid of what you think because it's impossible. <clears throat> I got this thing up and working. There were some problems with it, but I, I knew how to trace a signal because I traced a signal when I was 10 years old. There's the schematics, found it. So small strokes fell giant oaks. So I got it up and working and learned a hell of a lot about how electron microscopes work. Terry Tanaka let me put it in my garage or in his lab. <laughs> And it was just a long line of a microscope. So that's one small step. I've had many electron microscopes because I know about electron microscopes now. I know if I'm paying too much or whether I can fix it. This is my fourth electron microscope I got from the University of Tennessee for $5,000. It weighs three tons. I put it in my dental office. Had it transported all the way. Here it is. So you look at this and you see one thing. I look at it and I say, no problem, I'll figure it out, right? There's the difference in understanding what's possible. And I'm not an electronics wizard, I just have this stuff from American Basic Science Club, stuff I learned when I was 10. Okay, it's not like I took a college course in electronics. The advantage of being unafraid in life. I keep telling my son, if there, I can give you anything at all, any lesson at all, it's to how to live this, how to live in this world without being afraid. And I fear we're teaching an entire new generation exactly the opposite of how to be afraid. <clears throat> I'm not afraid of making a mistake. <laughs> My parents were very good about that. They, didn't, they knew that I was the kind of person that always bit off more than I could chew. I'm just that kind of person. I always bite off more than, dream bigger than I, I can do. And they were worried that I, would, that I would get discouraged by having so many failures. So they were very careful whenever I had a failure. And I've had more failure than probably all of you people in this room combined, believe me. You just see the successes. You don't see all the failures. And they were very good. They said, Gary, don't worry about the failure. The only important thing is what you learned from the failure. That's all that counts. And if you're not failing a lot, all that means is you're not pushing yourself hard enough. You're not pushing hard enough if you're not failing. You want to be failing. That's how you learn. <laughs> so where does all of this lead to? Well, let me show you where it leads to. This is, a, this is one of the magnetic lenses on the electron microscope. And magnetic lenses get very, very hot as the current goes, a lot of current goes through these lenses and they get very hot, so they have to be chilled. And they're chilled with this chilling water that goes through these tubes and it keeps the things. And if it's not chilled, the electron microscope shuts off within seconds. You turn it on and if the lenses heat up, it shuts off as a protective mechanism. So I, I, we get the thing up and working and it, it shuts off immediately. I said, hmm, let's take a look at the lenses. Take the lenses out and there's little pinhole holes in the lenses. Well, heck, 
I can do that. I learned to solder when I was 10 years old. I just solder them closed, fix the lenses, got them up and working. Now I have a million dollar, and a, a, a one and a half million dollar electron microscope. It's both a transmission scope and a scanning scope. And now I'm able to get really, really incredible pictures in my dental office. This is in my endodontic practice in the back of the thing. Rick, was this here when you visited? Do you remember? So now I'm getting some really nice biofilm pictures, but I don't, I'm not a biofilm guy. I don't, I don't know what I'm looking at. I call Winston Chi up at USC. I said, Winston, uh, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing some biofilm stuff, and I, I don't know that much of it. Do you have anybody there that knows anything about biofilm? I want to talk to somebody that actually studies this and, and knows. He says, are you kidding? Do you know who's in the office right next to me is Bill Costerton. I said, no, Bill Costerton's in Montana at the Biofilm Center. No, USC just hired him. He's right here, right next to me. I said, unbelievable. Can I come up and meet him? So I go up to USC and I meet the great one. And I take some pictures to him. And I remember this like it was yesterday. I walk into his office. I'm as nervous as hell. I have my pictures and I hand him the pictures. And he, he looks at one, he looks at another one, he looks up at me, doesn't say a word, looks at the next one, looks at the next one, and I'm thinking, oh shit, he doesn't like them. He says, where did you get these? I said, well, I, I made them, they're mine. <laughs> what do you mean, where did I get them? He said, what university? I said, well, I, I'm not with a university, I, but I have an electron microscope in my office. He couldn't believe it. Now, Bill Costerton is an elect, that's what he is. He's an electron microscopy. He knows electron microscopy. He couldn't believe, he's used to a university academic thing because these things are, are so expensive. They're only in institutions with a lot of funding. And then he says, can I come down and see your lab? in your dental office. I can't believe my good luck. So he comes down. <clears throat> he not only comes down, he brings some people in his circle, top scientists in the biofilm field with him. <laughs> this is Garth Ehrlich and Bill Costerton. Okay, now all of a sudden, I have access to the world's foremost authority the people that invented the biofilm film. They're in my office. I can't believe this. I love this picture of Bill because he came down to my lab probably five or six times and each time he had this look on his face. He simply can't believe it. <laughs> that a dentist has. He was completely transfixed by the fact that somebody could buy an old thing and fix it up and have it in his office. He's not, he was not used to that kind of environment. And eventually we became very good friends, very, very close friends, actually. And he took me under his wing and he mentored me. <laughs> and all of this, I hope you're able to draw the parallel, all of this from kits that I did when I was 10 years old, right? It's a direct result of, of that. So you never know really what's possible. So part of excellence is being exposed to excellence and a, a, it's a funny thing about accomplished people. They're surrounded by other accomplished people. So he brought me into his his little thing, and if you look at the names here, Christoph Chaudin, Paul Studley, Garth Ehrlich, Paul Webster, he introduced me to all these people, and now I'm having conversations with them, and I'm, I'm going up the curve like this. Bill Costerton told Winston Che had never seen anyone learn in biofilm stuff so fast, because initially he knew, he knew, I didn't know anything about biofilms, but he says, Gary went up the curve. I've never seen anybody go up the curve so fast in my whole life. And I think that's why we were such good friends. He, he kind of had a sense of the, 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 the path that I have taken. He calls me one day 
And he says, I want Christophe to come down to your lab and spend some time with you. Now, Christopher Chaudin is the finest electron microscopist in the world. He's the finest electron microscopist in the world. Bill Costerton had gone to Germany, grabbed him by the scruff of the neck. He was at the Koch Institute in Berlin. Grabbed him and said, you're coming with me. And he, he brought him to the Montana Biofilm Center, and then he took him from there to USC. So he calls me and says, I want Christoph to come down and spend some time with you. And I knew what he was doing. He wanted me to get some decent training, so I knew what the hell I was doing. This is Christoph in my lab. I learned so much from him. He gave me all the secrets. I, lear I learned how to process things. This is some of his work. He's a, also a confocal. And then with Rick, we did some papers with, with them together. So I learned, I learned a little bit about writing scientific papers and how good science, world-class science is done. So this is, it, it, this is the other lesson I wanted to get before we get onto the other part is it's who you surround yourself with that determines where you go. That's all it is. It's who you surround you. If you surround yourself with frivolous clinicians and mercenary clinicians, you will become a mercenary clinician yourself. If you surround yourself with serious people, clinicians of substance, you will become a clinician of substance yourself. It's all who you surround yourself with. Okay, so is this really much different than, than this? No, it's only a difference of degree. It's the same thing, really. Okay. I'm gonna skip through this. I think you get the point. There's a whole, th all of the things I've developed, it really comes from the American Basic Science Club. I learned about lenses. I developed these adapters. Uh, I, have, I was able to do this, because I had done it before. These are these mirrors. I had ground my own telescope mirrors. I knew how to grind them. I knew how to get a polished surface. I knew what a coating was. I, I knew how this, so when we went to develop our own mirrors, um, I knew, I had done it before. It was possible for me. I wasn't afraid of failing. I'm very proud of my son. He's, I couldn't figure out how to make these autoclavable. I don't know if many of you use these mirrors, but these mirrors are 100 times better than any other mirror in dentistry. They reflect almost 99% of the light. Uh, but you can't autoclave them. You got a cold sterile, and it was a real problem. And Donnie said, well, what should I do? I said, well, you figure it out. I'm, do I'm done with this. This is, this is your company. You, and he figured it out. And now we have these mirrors that are autoclavable. Now you look at them, you see, God, this is in these mirrors are incredible. What you don't see is all the failure that he had doing this. Tons of failure. You only see the success, but he wasn't afraid to fail. That's, that's, what, that's what I like. Here's the thing from Dale saying, God, these mirrors are incredible. They're autoclavable. Well, that's the end result. You don't see all the trial and error, the tens of thousands of dollars. It was a tens of thousands of dollars, Danny. I don't know if he's even here. Okay. How am I doing on time here? Are we late? Oh, so we're right on. I'm not right on time. Okay. This is my high school in Buffalo. I played freshman basketball, and I learned a great lesson from our coach. The first thing Coach Ratton did is make us believe. So he takes this hoop down. Because when you're 14, this thing is 10 feet up, and it looks, looks pretty small. And then he puts a basketball in it. This hoop's a lot bigger than you think it is, isn't it? You don't have to be that accurate, really, to put it, to put it in, OK? So the first, he did a very good thing. What is he working on? He's working on getting us to understand the possibility first. It's not that hard. You don't have to be perfect. 
You just have to be close and it'll go in because it's so big. So he gets, he plays with our mind a little bit. So the biggest hurdle is always the possibility. Then it was known in our community that the varsity coach, a guy by the name of Bob Hetler, had, had done a systematic analysis of high school basketball games. And what he found out was that 90% of high school basketball games are decided by the difference of missed fr and missed free throws. Okay? It was a statistical analysis of who, who wins high school basketball games. Well, you, you lose by missing foul shots because almost all high school basketball games, they're close at the end, right? Aren't they? They're close at the end. It comes down to one or two points. So he, he made a statement. And we knew this on the freshman thing. No one will start for me unless you can shoot 80% free throws. If you can't shoot 80%, you'll never start. And as a teenager, starting, that's a life and death matter. It's life and death as a teenager because the starters got the girls, right? <laughs> right? The starters are the ones that, if you're on the bench, you didn't get the girls. So being on the bench was like the, the worst thing that could happen in your life. <laughs> so we all knew this. So we understood the possibility because we had teams, we had teams ahead of us that did shoot 80%. So we didn't have to get by the toughest hurdle. God, is it even possible to shoot 80% free throws? Yeah, it's possible because a lot of people do it. And so we just had to figure out the details. That's the easy part. And figuring out the details on how to shoot 80% is easy. It's really easy. I, I laugh at these pro players that can't shoot 80%. It just blows my mind. It's so easy. Eight laws of learning are explanation, demonstration, imitation, repetition, repetition, repetition. So what did our coach have us do? Before practice, we shot 100 free throws. Then we practiced, and at the end, we couldn't go home until we shot another 100. So 200 a day, five, five days a week. Repeat it over and over again. And then every Friday they, they measured us. Okay, who can shoot 80% and who, who, who can't? <clears throat> what do you think happened? You think we had a normal distribution? No. Almost everyone could shoot 80%. Almost everyone. And this is where I learned this trick. What's the trick to really learning how to do this? Practice blindfolded. Why? This is not a visual skill. You know where the basket is. It's not moving. It's the same height. It never changes. It's the same distance. It never changes. There's nothing to see, really, is there? What happens when you practice blindfolded? What do you think happens? Your other senses are accentuated. This is a tactile. This is a tactile. It's tactile. It's just this. If you close your eyes, all of a sudden you're focused on this. Then the only other thing you have to do is you, you, you eliminate all the variables. So if you're like this, and then you, you, you try to do this. Well, there's too much variation here. You cut out all the variables. The first thing you do is you get your, you watch professional basketball. Play. What's the first thing they do? They get their foot. Because if you're not balanced on your feet, you'll never do it. You'll never, it'll never work. So the first thing is the foot. Then you go down. Then you, you eliminate this, this thing. You get your arms up like this. So now, there's only two vectors involved in putting this through that. One is a vertical vector, and that's the arch of the ball. Okay, The arch, if it's too great an arch, it comes down and it bounces, and it's no good. The arch has to be reproducible, the same arch each time, and the length has to be the same each time. Well, the arch of the ball 
The arch of the ball is controlled by your knee. That's the only variable. So you're like this. This is what gives the, art, the vertical component to the ball. This gives the horizontal component. So you, you analyze this systematically. You eliminate every variable. You get your feet. You're up like this. And you close your eyes. You won't believe how fast you get good at this. I haven't shot a basketball in probably 30 years. In, in a half an hour, I could shoot 80%. You never forget this stuff. Okay. Repetition, repetition, repetition. And you watch, you, it's very interesting. You watch these pro players. The first thing they do is they get their foot rep, right? Because if you, don't, if you don't do this, it'll never work. Then they take a breath. You notice that? They take a breath. And then what do they do? Most of them. They close their eyes. What are they doing when they close their eyes? They're hypnotizing themselves. Remember our TDO hypnotist? You can go into hypnotist like that. It just takes a second, and you can hypnotize yourself once you learn how to do it. They're hypnotizing them, so if they close their eyes, because at the end of the game, think about what's happening. It's not, only, it's not only a tactile thing, it's a cognitive thing. People are screaming at the top of their voice. They're, they're trying to distract you. If you can't shut that out, you'll, you'll never do it. If you let that distract you, you can't do it. You have to, hip, you have to go into the zone. You have to let your training take over in the environment that doesn't affect you at all. You take your breath, you close your eyes, you go into the zone, and then, you, then you've done this blindfolded so many times, you have it down 80%. Now, shooting above 80%, you know, that's different, but 80% is easy. See the guy on the left? He'll never do it. There's too much variation. He's got arm movement. The guy on the right is perfect. He's got his footwork, he's got his knees, and he's got the tactile thing. He'll be able to do it. How do you think Hetler's team did? Hmm? They kicked butt. Bob Hetler, he was the winningest basketball coach in New York State history. Okay. Okay, I'm going to do the last thing. I'm going to make a fool of myself here. I'm not a musician. I don't read music. I know a few chords. But I listen to this. I'm talking to millennials. You probably don't think this is so cool, but <laughs> to me, this is so cool. How does he do that? Did you hear that syncopated beat? <clears throat> I tell Jan and my son, you know what? I'm going to learn how to play that. I'm going to play that at the TDO meeting. I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn how to play that. My son, I wish he was here. He rolls his eyes. Dad, Paul Simon has played the guitar his whole life. You don't even read music. How are you going to learn how to play that? I said, Downey, I learned Morse code one, one letter at a time. I can learn this one note at a time. You see, I think I can do anything from what my mother taught me when I was 10. You see the difference? 
Because what my son didn't know was through the magic of radio waves, there's this thing called tablature. You don't need to read, know how to read music. It tells you in tablature which string, where to have your finger, and what note to play. And th through the magic of radio waves, I find tablature of the boxer. Just, just like I learned the Morse code. Okay, I may have you uh, click this when I'm ready. There's, there's a point to this and why I would risk making a complete fool of myself in, in, in front of you. because I'm not afraid of failure, okay? So, I'm sitting there looking at the tablature. It's not sounding like Paul Simon at all. I do this for a month. not getting better. Hmm. I wonder by this time I know every note, but I, I can't get it to sound like Paul Simon. No matter what I do, it doesn't it doesn't sound right. So then I do what I usually do. I said, you know, I need some more information. Why don't I I'm going to find out who, who the best in the world is at, at, at how to do this. I'm going to listen to what they say. Maybe they have some hints for me. Go ahead. I've been asked to uh, oh, teach uh, how to get started in fingerstyle. This is Tommy Emmanuel, widely considered the finest guitarist in the world. And through the magic of radio waves, I can have him teach me this. Okay, Jess. I've been asked to uh, teach uh, how to get started in finger style and uh, it's a wonderful journey it takes a little time and it takes a lot of effort it takes a lot of commitment and determination but uh, along the way you're going to learn so much and you're going to have so much fun getting started the the main thing that I want to kind of stress to you now uh, at this beginning level is that what, we're, what we've got to achieve first is getting that thumb to be independent from the fingers and, and create a steady groove. So in order to do that, if you've never done it before, um, most people want, want to play the second beat with their fingers like, like this. So you got beat one, then beat two. That's what I was doing. Beat three, beat one. Like if you do it that way, it'll never work. Okay, so you can't do that. What I'm gonna show you is the right way to get started, and that is get the thumb to do all the backing. Step one, as I've come to know in my, in my life, that there steps, is a definite right? line. There Break are people on this side who say, never anchor down, uh, you know, always keep your hand floating. And then there are people, where, which I'm, I'm one of, anchor down, it, it makes you play more solid. So, you know, you have to make that decision whether you, whether you anchor down or not. If you watch Merle Travis or Jerry Reed, or Chet Atkins, you'll see they all anchor down. I want to be on that team, the winners. Fingers down on the body and don't let those rebellious digits up. You've got to get the thumb to do this. Spell out the, the chord, right? So, five, four, six, four, five, four, six, four, right? Now, okay, Chet Atkins used to always say, develop a steady thumb. So, what is that called? What do we call that? What do I call it? That's called a keystone skill, a keystone habit. When you are struggling with something and you're not making any progress, look for the keystone skill, the keystone habit. As soon as I heard that, I knew I could do it. 
I was missing the keystone habit, a steady thumb. For one month, I do this, driving my wife crazy. What kind of a song is this? <laughs> steady thumb, I'm developing a steady thumb. She says, I think you've got it. No, I got it. It's, it's, I've, it's, I've got to, I, I don't want to think about it. It's got to be. So I wait until it's automatic and I don't have to think. I just pick up at the guitar and it's a steady thumb. After I have the steady thumb and it's automatic for me, try to throw in the other note. Steady thumb. Now I'm just doing one finger, then I then after that becomes automatic. Then I throw in the other finger. Then I try and play it. You know, it's still okay. Maybe a little, but it's not. It's not like it's not like Paul Simon. But I'm not worried. You know why? Because I'm still having to think about this. I have to wait for it to be automatic. And I know something from my cognitive training that automaticity is a function of two things, repetition and time. Because something happens when you sleep. And it's been shown even with things like guitar playing, if you, if you play right before you sleep, your brain is rewired. Do I have a slide that shows the cognitive thing there or not? Your brain is rewired while you sleep. And the cerebellum controls muscle memory, but in the central part of the brain, you, you have this rewiring that goes on. So I'm sitting here like this, and I'm just doing it over. I'm just waiting. I'm just sleeping. And then all of a sudden, I wake up one day, and instead of this, I have this. Oh my God. How did that happen? I'm not having to think about anything. Right? Does this make sense to you? the steady thumb. Keystone skills. Keystone skills. Okay. So when we're training our assistants, and maybe they're a little frustrated, maybe they're not getting as, as quiet, we just, I just say, don't worry about it. Just keep repeating it over and over again. You'll get it. You need to sleep. And it, it's rewired while you sleep. So I think many, when I talk to many endodontists, why they don't train this way, what, what happens? They just give up. They get frustrated, they're impatient, they don't understand why it can't happen overnight. You know, one month, I'm sitting there, steady thumb, one month. My wife's ready to throw me out. She says, I can't take this any longer. <laughs> okay. I think you're up now, aren't you? Okay.
So give a warm welcome to Jess, please. This is her first time talking to this group, so I know she's going to do great. Huh? Oh, yeah, that's the thing. Okay. Okay. I just want to make sure. That, okay. So I'm Jess. I'm working with Dr. Carr, and I'm just going to expand on what he's demonstrated in this presentation and throughout his life on how to train um, professionals and be successful. So how to train yourself and your team. Um, we know that all these sayings have came from hopeful insight on how you can help accomplish your goals. So let's put them to use and see if you can develop a world-class team. And that's what we want to do is inspire you to train the team that you want to be the best you can in your practice. When you begin, your mindset is important. So make sure you know what you want and make sure you have a successful goal in mind and how to get there. And you convey that to your team because if they don't see success with you, then it's not gonna work out. And I think this is really important, um, and Gary can speak to this more than I can, but be the kind of boss, teacher, father, or mother, and friend that you had or wish you had. Um, and that's something that Dr. Carr definitely has shown me, and I think Joy, uh, at our practice, is he is such a good leader, such a good boss. He shows us compassion, he's kind, he demonstrates what he thinks should be done, and then we try to imitate his greatness. So dream big, but focus small. And begin with the end in mind. And some of this is just reinforcing what Dr. Carr has already said. A professional is someone who makes the difficult look easy. And Dr. Carr, you might want to speak to this because this is your slide. What you, want to, what you want to aim for is having patients tell you this. This is just a little snippet I took from, from a patient. But if you're really doing this at the level that you want, you'll, you'll be hearing this all the time. We, we hear it all the time, every single week. Go ahead and play it. Uh, anticipate anything other than maybe a little soreness from the shot and sometimes the teeth get a little tender. If you have any trouble, give me a call. Okay. And I'll see you in a month. And oh. the next visit is really easy. I oh, just good. take the old stuff out, do my little uh -huh. millimeter preparation. Okay, so it's simpler than that. It's much simpler. This was the tough one? This was the tough one. Okay. Well, I must Not tough, critical. This was the critical one. <laughs> Well, it's not supposed to be tough for me, you know. <laughs> Maybe it's tough for you, but it's not supposed to be tough for me. <laughs> I must say the two of you work like ballet stars. <laughs> she's the, she, she's the these, she's the secret of my success, but I I, I, yeah. I don't want anyone to know. Uh, anticipate anything other than maybe a little soreness from the shot, and sometimes the teeth. So never let them see you sweat. That's what Dr. Carr was doing in that video. Even though that might have been a difficult procedure, he didn't let the patient know that it was difficult. I just think, look at Olympic figure skaters and that they make it look so easy, don't they? It's, that's what real professionals do. The highest compliment a patient can pay me is when we get up and they say, are you all, all done? Yeah, what's good? why is this so expensive? It seems so easy. That's what professionals do. They make difficult things look easy. That's what you, where you want to, that's what you want to do. Never let them see you sweat. Never let them see you struggle. <clears throat> so we're going to go back to um, how to train people professionally. And Dr. Carr has shown you multiple ways that he's developed keystone habits. That's something you should take into your own practice. Develop keystone habits in your training. Realize the early small wins, that's important. You need to recognize the good things that are happening and those will compound on each other. Understand that this is incremental and sequential. 
it's going to come in small increments and sequences to develop, just like the guitar for Dr. Carr. Um, set goals, measure your performances, delegate accountability, and repetitive practice with feedback is key. And that's going to be something we're going to go over uh, several times, repetition. And then develop a consistent process in everything you do. So the first step is explain the process and the details. You're going to explain it thoroughly so they understand what the process is, what you expect. And then they're going to, um, you're going to demonstrate it, and the individual is going to practice it thousands of times until it becomes automatic. You're going to review every skill every day from day one, just like Dr. Carr did with his Morse code. Our four suggestions from our team that may help you when you're training your team is, first of all, learn muscle memory skills first without the microscope. You want the muscle memory to become automatic, and the microscope adds another element of confusion. So learn the muscle memories first before you try to teach them under the scope. Encourage that they practice blindfolded or with their eyes closed, just like shooting the free throws. This will help tactile sensations and it, when your eyes are closed, your other senses then come into play and it reinforces that the movements are correct, that the skill set is being learned correctly. And always have the assistant practice as the doctor. And Dr. Carr wanted to add in and GoPro yourself because this makes a big difference for the positive feedback because you can see your mistakes and learn from them. So this is the schedule we use. You can modify it to your own schedule, but this is what Dr. Carr has found successful and we saw success when we were doing our training demonstration. Day one is mirror passes. You want to start with something simple. You don't want to overwhelm the person at first. So something that's going to happen in your practice over and over, such as mirror passes. Day two was hand instrument passes, the rubber dam, and combinations of those things. So we did combinations of passing the instruments, taking the rubber dam on and off. Day three was irrigation syringes and anesthetic syringes. And you can read the rest of how we move forward. Um, but the most important thing is that you do incremental and sequential building on these skill sets. And as John Wooden said, the importance of repetition until automaticity cannot be overstated. Repetition is the key to learning, and that's definitely what we found in our training um, session. Okay, so we're really excited about having you learn this, and I want you to understand right off the bat what the procedure is, how we're going to proceed. So the first thing uh, to realize is, first of all, we, you will never be asked to do anything on a live patient that you are not completely trained for it's hard to hear. and have done. It's hard to hear. So that video, I think, is important. What Dr. Carr is telling Ingrid, Ingrid had never done any dental assisting before. Some of you may know Ingrid. She works for TDO. This was his first um, training session with Ingrid, and what he did was reassure her and tell her how the process was going to work and that she was never going to be asked to do something with a live patient or in the operatory until she had been properly trained and it had been demonstrated and she had repeated it hundreds of times. So we wanted her to understand that we were going to help her make, make, help make her feel comfortable before we asked her to perform anything. And I think that's really important. So this goes back to the thing of the difference between training someone and creating a culture. Yes, we're training Ingrid, but we're really creating a culture of excellence. What is the culture? The culture is, Ingrid, we, will, we are protective of you. You come first. Your health comes first. Your stress comes first. We, are, we will never put you in a position where you, you are not comfortable doing what you're doing or under very high stress. That's our culture. That's the difference between simply training someone and training for a culture. So we're sitting here training Ingrid, but what I'm really doing is I'm telling Ingrid, my employees are important to me. Their health is important. Their stress is important, more important than anything really. 
It, it actually comes before patient care. If I see Joy stressed or un, uncomfortable with the thing, I can't work. I stop working, oh, wait a minute, let's figure this out. Because Joy's health is important to me. That's our culture. Can, can you, I hate to keep over, that's, you need to see the distinction here between just simply training and creating a culture. When you are training, that's what you're doing. You're creating a culture about what are the highest values? What is most important? What is your priority? That's what you're creating. That's what you create. Training is just a way to get there. Okay. So I'm gonna to continue to show videos of our training with Ingrid um, to demonstrate all of these things we've been trying to, that Dr. Carr has been reiterating in his um, presentation today. And we're gonna walk through what we think is important in these videos. Okay, so we're really excited. And this goes back to what smart people do. They surround themselves with other accomplished people and they take complex tasks and break them down into simpler ones. And I want you to keep that in mind as you're watching Ingrid's training. No, she's going to change it, and we're going to learn this by steps. This is step one, touch. Step two, grab. Step three, place. Step four, exit. It's four steps, we're going to do it. Step one, touch. Step two, grab. Step three, place. Step four, exit. So by breaking this skill down into steps, we've simplified the task, which helps Ingrid see the different components she needs to focus on when performing the skill. And if you do, do John Wooden, if you do small things right, then big things can happen. So we're gonna watch again. Ingrid's, this was Ingrid's first day of being um, introduced to mirror passing. And we broke it down into steps to try to teach her. This is a comparison of Ingrid's training from the moment she started to at the end of the session. This is her very first try, very first one. So she has never done any dental assisting before. This is her first exposure to an instrument pass. And you can see that they're reinforcing and demonstrating what is important in that skill set, the touch, the way she holds the mirror handle. We're focusing on all the little tiny details, all of the This nuances. is called training people professionally. One step this is how time. you do it professionally. Not on the fly, but We're professionally. Good keystone habits, which we will build upon throughout this whole training. So now we're demonstrating it again. And the second time she sees it, she will see additional things. So this is Ingrid at the end of that session. This is at the end of a 60-minute training period. And you can see Ingrid started to pick the skill up pretty quickly after repetition of demonstration and imitation. That's <laughs> and positive reinforcement of Joy telling her she's doing it correctly. Good. So this is day five after we've um, introduced other skills. This is Ingrid going over them with Joy one by one. And what we need to, um, I guess, really emphasize is that this was an incremental building process we didn't get this far without every day repeating prior skills. Every day Ingrid came in, we repeated the skills she learned the day before, and then we built on those skills. So in this 
This day, Joy and Ingrid are practicing every skill set Ingrid had learned up to that time, just to make sure she was still comfortable with those skills before we introduce new skill sets. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Is that awesome or what? Yeah. Huh? It's pretty awesome, right? And then this is the sound's not very good, so I'm going to talk over it. But this is when we start incorporating some of the other difficult tasks beyond just the muscle memory of the skills. This is Joy demonstrating to Ingrid the record keeping at the same time. And then eventually, after record keeping, we're going to introduce the microscope and have Ingrid practice all the skills put together. But before every skill, before we introduced the record keeping or the microscope, she repeated the skills she had learned prior to make sure that those were still coming automatically. Yeah, I guess that one just needed to fast forward. Sorry, I can't fast forward to the spot I wanted to. Uh -uh. Take our word for it. <laughs> she was really good. <laughs> so how to train people professionally. Just to reiterate, and we're going to have Ingrid and Joy speak to this as well, about their experience training. But developing keystone habits is essential. And then recognizing those small wins and understanding that it's incremental and sequential and that it takes time. You can't expect it to happen right away, can we, Ingrid? <laughs> Set goals, measure your performance, and delegate accountability. And this works not just for only training your assistants, but training yourself as well professionally. And I'm going to show a quick demonstration of how this also works for me to train myself ergonomically in the operatory before we move on and let Joy and Ingrid speak to this. So um, part of my training with Dr. Carr has been I film. We go pro my procedures, and then Dr. Carr, Joy, and I review them together so that we can see what I could work on, what, where I could be improving. And uh, one of the things in the video you're going to see next is we had reviewed film the day before of me uh, and Joy working on a patient, and Dr. Carr had pointed out that my cart placement was not as ergonomically efficient as it could have been. I was still having to reach for my instruments more than we would have liked. So part of having a good team is Joy then definitely helped me. She started moving the cart for me and saying, we're going to put it here. So Joy and I developed a better placement of the cart that helped us work more ergonomically. And those are just little small goals that we identified from watching video of ourselves. Obviously, there's other things I can work on, and I will still continue to get better and improve. But this was one um, demonstration of how recording yourself and working towards those goals as a team can help you become better as a professional. So in this video, if you watch where, when I'm picking up the, ha the hand piece and putting it back down, before I was having to reach more behind me because I wasn't pulling the cart close to myself. And, and this was a small win for Joy and I because I finally <laughs> got the cart into a better position, right Joy? Yes. <laughs> Look at Jess's posture. See how she's perfectly relaxed, straight up and down, not bent, ideal posture. That's how they both should be, perfectly relaxed at ease. So I think the big thing to keep in mind is when training your team, whether it be training your assistant, training yourself, training your associate, that everything takes time and you have to be willing to give the person time and attention to develop the skill sets and to achieve the team you want to have, to see your end goal in mind and then put the time in to get to there. That's what I, my take home from training the assistant experience with Ingrid and Joy was. So now I think um, we want to let Joy and Ingrid speak to their training experience real quickly. 
And we'll end with Matt. Yeah, yeah and great. then we'll have Matt do a quick um, team explanation of his job. Okay, um, Joy wasn't quite ready to throw me out of the operatory, <laughs> but uh, uh, what I can say was a wonderful experience. Thank you, Dr. Carr, to you know have me star today, one of the stars. Uh, autographs will be out there in the front <laughs> later. <laughs> now, of course, I believe in repetition, and probably a lot of you have heard me saying you have to try again. That's how you schedule an appointment. Because, you know, as a trainer, I make people repeat. And I suggest do it later after the training. But it was just amazing to see a different skill, like, a, you know, motion instead of, you know, your brain and, you know, software. So it was great. And uh, thank you. Thank Ingrid, you for your patience, Ingrid, too. Ingrid, could you just say, because I know this was new to you, the value of the blindfolded aspect of it yes. and learning the doctor side, because I think that is almost never done in the endodontic yeah, field. Have, uh, yeah, having the opportunity to sit and, and pretend I was a doctor and place myself and everything made a big difference. So I would say it didn't take too long. It was just a few minutes that I sat on the doctor chair and Joy was the assistant. And that made me understand everything, the, the, the little details of the touch and the position of the hand so definitely helped me a lot, I would say, having that experience. Joy, did I behave? Okay. Yeah, I, I, it's just like what I mentioned yesterday that uh, if you do repetition and 200 times training to each other and it'll help a lot. You're gonna miss it. Oops. <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> so just real quick to come back to Dr. Carr's point about <laughs> shooting a basketball and repetition. Um, this is me in high school, my high school basketball team. So when Dr. Carr told me he was going to use the basketball analogy, it made perfect sense to me. I actually played basketball in high school and in college. So uh, I had many coaches who made us stay late and shoot free throws and I could relate to what Dr. Carr was telling me, but the big difference in all the coaching I experienced through my basketball career was the coaches who actually made you stay late and practice free throws, but first demonstrated and explained how to properly shoot that free throw, how to be successful, so that the repetition that you were doing over and over to get the muscle memory was correct. Because you can stay all night and shoot free throws, but if you're doing it incorrectly, then what good does it do? And a lot of, there are a lot of coaches out there who get the concept of stay late, shoot 100 free throws. But if they're not willing to put the time in to show you the correct form and the correct way to shoot that free throw, then they're not really helping you become a better player. And that's the same as your team. So make sure you invest, demonstrate, and show them the correct way, and then do repetition. And that, that builds you towards success. And I don't know if you can tell which one I am. Dr. Carr couldn't tell who I was in this picture. But in the back row, yep, second from the left. But she's cheating because her sister's there too. <laughs> <laughs> My sister's number 43. 41, I don't, you could see the one. I was a sophomore in high school, so I'm pretty young in that picture. <laughs> All right, so now I think we're going to have Matt speak real quickly to team training. How's it going, Matt? Uh, I've done a lot of hairy things in my life, but getting up on a stage and talking in front of people is probably the hairiest. It always freaks me out a little bit. Um, I'm Matt. I'm an active duty SEAL at a West Coast base team here in San Diego. I've done a couple deployments to Iraq and uh, one to Yemen. Um, you know, Gary was, I think Gary's done a really good job and, and so has Jess about hitting teamwork and, and some of the things that Gary has said, to, said today are some of the things that are actually, you know, taught when we're put through selection and, and we're kind of, the big ones, I guess, that stood out to me that, that I would beg you to take home as key points are complex problems, right? We, when we train, we start 
I'm going to use room clearance. All of that starts outside the door before you're even in the room. From foot placement to the deep breath to, to what foot goes through the door first, depending on where we're going. Because in our situation, when things hit the fan and, and things always hit the fan, you're going to default to your highest level of training. So you need to start with those small, small details and you work from there. And, and for us, that starts outside the door and then next goes to the foot inside the door, goes to the corner, goes to our first scan, our second scan. And then once we have a basic room down, we start adding problems. We add people, we add barricades, blah, 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 blah. Um, the other, the other one that I guess that I'd like to hit on is um, when you do those repetitions, slow is smooth and smooth is fast, right? So for us, as we break down those small little steps, we're doing them slow because all that slow gives you time to process and you become smoother. I don't know. <laughs> um, And then mindset. Mindset was the biggest one I think Gary hit today. Um, if, if I've learned anything in my life through joining the teams, it's that you are capable of what you believe you are capable of. You just have to not be afraid to fail. And I think for me, the only type of failure that I fear is not living up to my true potential and not putting myself out there enough. But failing everyday tasks is is... It's nonchalant, right? You're just kind of, oh, whatever, I failed. No one's going to crucify you for trying something that you're uncomfortable with and failing. It's just a part of life. Yeah. Gary, is there anything you, like, you. you wanted me to hit on? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk just a little bit about the culture of the SEALs. Yep. In, in other words, that uh, your commitment to your team, what that yep. means, what that means to you, yep. and how that's de how did how did that develop? By uh, so, I think maybe. So I'll break it down real quick. We're in uh, two-year cycles. We have a six-month period of professional development, and we have a six-month period of what we call unit line training and then a six month period of TGIT, and then we're gone for six months on deployment. And I think what, what maybe you're talking about is the culture, and that's really developed for us in the first six months when we get our new guys, you know, the guys who have just checked in from BUDS and SQT. It's, that's our time to train these guys and how we expect them to behave, and, and we really start to invest our time into these guys because at the end of the day, I'm gonna live with these guys for six months. I'm gonna be with them almost every day for two years and they're gonna determine whether I come home or not. And so I, I don't expect them to show up and know everything. Um, and I always tell my new guys, I don't care if you don't know something, but if you don't ask questions, I'll assume you know it. And when you get it wrong, that's when I'll be mad. So the culture that, that we have tried to bring up in our platoon is that ask questions, ask them often, and don't be afraid to tell me you don't understand something. Don't be afraid to say, hey, I, I'm not getting this. I have no problem staying late with my new guys and, and after hours and teaching them things that they don't understand. And so for us, I'll just reiterate, for us, every shooter needs to understand what's going on in every level of the platoon because there can come a point when s s shit hits the fan and the guy who was in charge is no longer with us or he's incapacitated and now guess what the lowest level guy has to be able to make the calls or the decisions because everyone else is consumed with situations i take it you don't have any entry level people then do you <laughs> <laughs> no we don't the uh we we really don't you know yeah, entry level, I guess, was when you joined the Navy. Yeah. Um, and then you're not entry level anymore. And, and uh, yeah. No. Okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you course. so much, Matt. Yeah. yeah.
we're done. Yeah. Any, let's open it up for questions. We have five minutes. Any questions? Don't be afraid. We answered everything, huh? Wow. Oh, oh what? I can't sing. Um, uh, Question, Dr. Question, Dr. Jerbo. So I've been with you for a long time, coming every year, every year, every year, and I found myself like right before I switched my position, my dental assistants and I worked really well together. We trained each other really well. But now I'm in a brand new situation, and I have a pair that she's helped me before, and her and I kind of worked pretty well, but she didn't have, we didn't have the cold. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's fair to her that um, you put her in a position with, this, with, with being at the scope and you're with, with uh, real patients. I, I think you need to work out whatever the problems are, what you're struggling with. You put a staff member in or a, a, a mannequin and you work through these problems in that kind of environment instead of with a real patient. It's not, just not right to do this and expecting to kind of, do, the way most dentists do it, they do it on the fly. And that's a terrible way to train someone. It's absolutely terrible. Um, so what we did with, with Ingrid, we put a staff member in the thing and then you're not, you're not worried about it. And you go over these things. And this incremental nature, it, it happens in little tiny bites and eventually, like the guitar, eventually you kind of, this becomes automatic and it won't be fun and it won't be easy until everything is automatic. When do you switch hands? When, what hand uses a suction for what? You need to go over this over and over and over again until it's automatic. But I don't like the idea of doing this with live patients and training on the fly. That, that's a very poor way to do it and I wouldn't do it that way. Yeah. So let's say you've got systems and training them, they've done well, and let's say it's a year, two years, three years down the line, and you feel like maybe things like practice in the beginning, and then you just work on patients. And then you feel like doing something's not as great as it used to be, right? How often do you go back and review those steps and you just Joy and I are changing stuff all the time. We, we're thinking of stuff that, this is part of the growth mindset. You're always thinking about stuff that you can do better, but it's an iterative process. Joy, Joy trains me more than I train her now. So I, I, I say to her, Joy, is there, what can I do to make your thing easier? And she said, well, you're doing this, don't do this. I oh, okay. So we're changing stuff all the time. I, I, think, I think a better answer is that you need to give your assistant the opportunity to critique you. I have no problem with Joy critiquing me. She does it all the time, all the time. Just, I, have, I have no problem because it makes me better. My job is to make, my job is maybe to do a good root canal, a great root canal, but I have a job even before that and that's to make, the thing that, this is my observation and some of you may not like this, it comes as a shock to dentists that their assistants actually have another life. <laughs> they have another life. When they leave your life, they actually have another life that's actually more important to them. Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? Dentists have a hard time understanding this. I want Joy to go home. I don't want her to go home beat up or like the YouTube thing says, which is really not only a form of physical abuse, it's a form of psychological abuse 
the dentists are subjecting their assistants to. I want her to go home and have, be, be strong and be, be alert and not be beat, beat to heck. That's, in, that's really important to me. That's part of our culture, that I want her other life to be fulfilling too, just not her life with me. So I'm always thinking, what can I do to make Joy less tired during the day? Does that make sense? Um, so I've given her, she's very comfortable critiquing me, N no problem. She says, Dr. Carr, you've got food all over your face, why don't you wipe your, you know, I mean, it's, it's no problem. So this iterative back and forth is, is very good because I don't have entry level employees. We're part of a team and we're all equal. Joy is an equal to me. Dr. Jess is an equal to me. We don't have a hierarchy in our office. Did that answer it, or I don't know if I answered it well, yeah. Yeah, give, give your assistants the opportunity to critique you, welcome it. Don't, don't take it personally. It helps you. you, it's a growth mindset type of thing. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. How do you help an assistant that has some fears and doesn't have a growth mindset? So the question really is, how do you give someone a, a growth mindset? And the way you do that really was, is with encouragement and um, you might wanna tap down the criticism a little bit. People respond to positive reinforcement. I give Joy, a, I, I tell Joy all the time, she's the greatest dental assistant in the world. It doesn't matter how many times I tell her that, it's important to her. It's positive encouragement. But to your question, changing a non-growth set mindset to a, to a growth mindset, it's tough, it takes work, it takes love, it's, it's just hard to do. Sometimes you find the key, sometimes all it takes is a small win or a keystone skill. One little thing can, can turn it around. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, more. Thousands of times. Yeah. That, that first video of Ingrid, that was an hour of her just doing mirror passes. When not, we... yeah. not hundreds of times, thousands of times. Thousands. I just explained it to my wife. I need a steady thumb. A steady thumb. A month. I did that for a month. I don't know. I don't think that's discipline. That's just, that's what you need to do. <laughs> yes, I, th I say it's a little bit discipline. Yeah. But, because uh, Gary said to me at one point, this might be boring to you, but this is important. And so you just focus on the, the end goal. It's important to get this down. So maybe for you doing the instrument passes with the assistant is boring to do it for an hour. But if you want them to achieve it in the long run, you have to put that in, and that, that's discipline to get what you want out of your team. That's let, my impression. Yeah, of it. let me put it another way that may make, may make you understand this better. Yes, it takes discipline to do this repetition, but the joy at the end, the pleasure at the end, comes with this automaticity that you, you do this and you don't ever have to think about it. It's just automatic. And that is. That is really a pleasurable thing. When I was doing the guitar and I, I, I was like, it still isn't right, it still isn't, and then I just woke up one day and it was automatic. You can't imagine how pleasurable that is. It's pleasure, so you're willing to put up with the discipline if you know the end goal is gonna be really pleasurable for, bo for both you and your assistant. And, and maybe we should have shown more of the videos of Ingrid, but there's videos, I mean, 
Dr. Carr would sit down as the doctor, I'd sit down as the doctor, Joy would sit down as the doctor, then Ingrid would be the doctor, and we'd all rotate through repetition, repetition, and having Ingrid be the doctor with Joy as the assistant. And I've been the assistant in my own training so that I understood what is the assistant feeling when I'm not letting go of the mirror, I'm grabbing. Um, so it's important for every person of the team to understand the other person's role, I think. Joy likes to be the doctor and tell me what I'm doing wrong as the assistant. <laughs> Yeah, what, what you find with this kind of training, really any kind of training revolving, involving muscle memory, is it's, it, it would be very odd to have a training longer than an hour that would be very valuable. You're much better off with tr maybe training an hour in the morning, an hour at night, or even just an hour a day, and, and doing it every day. You know, th not much is gained by instead of spending an hour, spending three hours. Not much is gained. You've gained about everything you're going to gain in that first hour. Wouldn't you agree, Ingrid? It's the first hour. Yeah, that's a good question, though. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you just can't power through. Oh, I'm just going to train for 12 hours a day. It doesn't, it'll never work that way. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you.